reached land at the place they were heading for. Next day, the crowd which had stayed on the other side of the lake realized that there had only been one boat there. Pride of 
associated with it. Jesus told him to go back to the other side of the lake. Because of that, they didn't like him. But Jesus was their master, and they did what he said. They were complaining. Uh, they were doubting. They began to think, why does Jesus not let us get in charge? Why doesn't he just stamp out his enemies? If he can do all these things, why doesn't he just, just take charge and rule? And that, they begin to doubt his power. They begin to think, well, maybe he's not who he claims he is. I mean, after all, he let John the Baptist die. Why couldn't he do something more? Why couldn't he have been stronger? Why didn't he stop the Romans? And, and why does he just keep backing off? Maybe he's in an, an imposter. They were thinking about all these things and they began to criticize. In fact, they got to the point where they were angry at themselves. They, they said, well, we should have made Jesus king. We should have just not listened to what he said and just did whatever we wanted to do. And they were upset and they were angry. They were criticizing, they were complaining, and they were doubting. And the disciples needed a storm. They needed a storm. Jesus will order a storm for his church when they forget their purpose. Jesus will order a storm for his church when they forget their purpose. See, the purpose of the church is to make disciples. Amen. Amen. If you're not making disciples, then you're not doing what God had commanded us to do. Everything else is not important. Everything else is secondary. Making disciples is the single most important thing. And a disciple maker is a reproducer. If you come to church, if you give your tithe, if you are, uh, if you are in the choir or, or in the praise team or whatever you may be in, but you are not making disciples, then you're not doing what God has asked us to do. And our purpose has been thwarted. Our purpose has been messed up sometimes because we think that just coming to church is church. But sometimes you can waste your time in worship. If you're not making disciples, then you are causing people not to be disciples. You can't be both. You're either a disciple maker or you are a disciple stopper. Sure. Amen. Amen. You can't be, oh, I'm both. No, no, no. The devil has the middle of the road. Either you are making disciples. And listen, when we make disciples, we make it because of the lives that we live. You don't just talk about it, you live it. You are really about it, and that's what happens. And when you're not making disciples, then you're complaining about the system. I don't like the nominating committee. I don't like the board. Those elders don't know what they're doing. I don't, I don't like the conference. The conference is all messed up. And you begin to complain. What's wrong with the church? They're not organized. All these people come to church and not, they're not giving, and you're not giving yourself, but you complain about the people who are not giving. Yeah. 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 Are, you, are you listening to me tonight? Yeah. It, it's easy to complain, and, and, and when you start complaining, complainers are not disciple makers. Yeah. Whenever somebody complains, you know they're not making disciples. And so when someone's complaining, they're really not being a disciple. And a complainer needs a storm. Turn to your neighbor and say, do you need a storm? Yes. Not only that, the disciples begin to criticize. They begin to criticize. And sometimes that's what we do. We get into criticism. You know, we're good at criticism. Amen? We can criticize our leaders. We won't be the leader. Uh, we need a Sabbath school superintendent. No, I'm not going to be it. And then they pick somebody to be the superintendent and say, why did they get hurt? <laughs> we need some more, we need some deacons in the church and you won't do any deaconing. Sure. Are, are y'all listening to me today? Yeah. It, it's easy to criticize other different people. We, we are easy to talk about what they're doing wrong. And when you criticize your leaders, then the God of heaven says, 
you need a storm. Yes. Turn to your neighbor and say, do you need a storm? Yes. You need a storm. Yes. Uh, uh, there are so many times that we doubt the mission of the church. Why are we doing it this way? <laughs> why, why do we have to why do we have to preach the gospel like this? Why do we have to go, you know, maybe we should just not do anything. Maybe we should just stay at home and, and we doubt the mission that God has called us. We doubt the doctrines and we doubt what we actually have said we believe. And when we start doubting, then God says, they need a storm. We make our problem so big that God says, I need to take your mind off the little problem that you made up and give you a real problem. Mm. Amen, amen, amen again. Amen. If you keep on complaining, God will help you out. Yeah. You keep on criticizing, God will say, well, look, let me help you out. I'll show you a thing to do. I used to hate when my mother would do this. She would, she would beat me, and I'd start crying. And then she'd say, stop crying. <laughs> if you keep crying, I'm going to beat you some more. I mean, I mean, after all, I mean, if you get beat, shouldn't you cry? But she said, if you keep on, because evidently she thought I was crying too much. If you keep on complaining and you think God has given you a hard time, then he'll send you a storm. And the storm will be greater than what you've been complaining about. I better say thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so God allows storms to come into our lives when we complain when we criticize and when we doubt. And so in your home and in your life, when you're complaining and criticizing and doubt, you better get ready because a storm is on the way. Oh. Amen. You know how, I, I, let me just see if I can divert from my message. If you want storms, if you want to try to stop the storms or ease the storms, start praising God. Amen. Wake up in the morning and say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Wake up in the morning and say, you've been mighty good to me. I don't have any money in the bank, but, but God is still on my side. I, I got a pain in my side, but God is still good. Uh, people don't talk to me anymore in the church, but I got a Savior that loves me, and he's always by my side. Praise God, regardless, and it doesn't matter who's listening. If you want storms to kind of stop in your life, you start praising God and singing and saying, the Lord is my refuge and my strength. Uh, uh, Jesus. 
the Bible says they were affrighted. They were so messed up that they could not even recognize Jesus anymore. They thought it was a ghost on the water. I can see those boys. They thought they had a hard time with the storm. We're not gonna miss Then all of a sudden, a ghost shows up. <laughs> Where are you gonna go if you're in a boat? You, you can't get in the stormy water. The ghost is coming. It's coming. You're, you're talking about a problem. Yeah. They, what can, they start roaring because it just said, oh man, we messed up, man. <laughs> we're in a storm. We gotta go. What's going on? And finally, Jesus came closer. I'm so glad Jesus comes closer. Yeah. Jesus came closer, and they realized, and they looked at him, and they realized that it was Jesus. And the Bible lets us know that when they saw him, that they saw him right in the storm, walking on the water. Every church has to go through a storm, but every church is not Jesus' church. There are some churches that have no storms. Mm. Okay. Some churches, Satan loves them. Mm. They work right along with him. Listen, God has many, many people, millions of people, yeah. billions of people that are on his side. Yeah. But God only has one church. Mm. Okay. Hey. Okay. Amen. 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 Uh, let me say that again. God has billions and millions of people that are on his side, that will follow him, that will be saved. But God only has one church. I'm going to try to help you out, brothers, that, 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 <laughs> that believe in more than one wife. Help me, Holy Ghost. <laughs> God is married to his church. Am I right about it? Yes. He's married. He doesn't have two churches he's married to. <laughs> Am I right about it? He doesn't have two churches. He only has one church that he's married to. He's married to this church. And he's, he says, this is a special church for me. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, he says that I find in the church it's like a woman and the relationship between the, 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 the husband and the wife is the same relationship between Christ and the church. And Christ loves this church. Isn't, am I right about it? Yes. He says that he loves this church and he proves his love because he dies for his church. But he only has one church. And there are many people in all different types of denominations. There are people that don't even go to church that are God's people. Don't miss this. There are Catholic, Methodist, Pentecostal. There are all sorts of different people that don't even go to church. People that are maybe, maybe even Muslims are, are Buddhists, whatever. And they may be people of God. See, number one, you can't judge who people are. But you can judge a church. How can you judge a church, Pastor Horton? I'm glad you asked. It's found in the Word of God. See, what God has, he has this book called the Bible that describes the characteristics of his church. Okay. And so I'm not going to make up something. I'm going to bring it from the word of God. Is that all right? Yeah. Write it down because what I want you to do, I want you to judge whatever church you believe in by the characteristics that are described in the word of God. All right? Okay. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. What book did I say, everybody? Yeah. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. You're not going to get this everywhere. You are, you're blessed tonight because I don't know of any other church that teaches this, but the church that I'm a member of. Uh, but it's all in the Bible. And what I challenge you is to find it in the Bible and to prove it and, and line up the church that you're in by the, by the word of God. What does the Bible say? We put it on the screen. The dragon, wait a minute. Who is this dragon? If we had time tonight, we'd go back to the, the, the other parts of this verse and we'd find out that the dragon is the who? The devil. All right? The dragon. Read the whole chapter. Revelation chapter 12, and you can read the whole chapter. I have no time to go through the whole thing tonight. But the dragon is symbolic of the devil. The dragon was angry. Wrath means angry, all right? With the woman. And if we find this text that Jesus only has one woman, the devil is not 
mad with all the women. He's only mad with one. It's God's woman that the devil doesn't like. He hates God's woman. He was angry. He was raw with the woman. And he went to do what, everybody? Make war. Make war. The devil is hostile. He's angry. He's belligerent. He wants to kill this woman. He wants to make war. But it's with the remnant of her seed. The remnant is the last one. Am I right about it? C is the children, the last children, the last part, the last group of people on the earth that are God's people are the remnant people. These are the people that the devil is angry at. Who are these people? The Bible describes it, and you don't need to have a bachelor degree or a scientific degree to figure it out. All you have to do is read it. Which key the commandments of God. Let's put a comma right there. If you're a part of a church that believes it's okay to steal, then you can't be in God's church. Am I right about it? Isn't there a commandment against stealing? How many people know that there's a commandment against stealing? I want to know because if not, I'm going to try to move some stuff out the way of y'all. Amen? But if you're a part of a church that believes it's all right to lie, then you cannot be in the church of God. Am I right about it? Isn't it clear? They keep the commandments. If you are part of a church that says it doesn't really matter if you obey your parents, in fact, you can disobey your parents and that's okay, then you are not in God's remnant church. If you are part of a church that believes you can bow down to idols, help me, Holy Ghost. You can bow down to idols and pray to other idols, then you can't be a, a part of the commandment keeping church because the Bible and the commandment says, Thou shalt not have any other God before me. Thou shalt not make into thee any graven images. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Am I telling the truth tonight? Yes. Is everything I said right? These are the commandments. Listen, let me see if I can. You know where I'm going. If you are part of a church that doesn't believe that they should remember the seventh day to keep it holy, because that's the one of the commandments. Am I right about it? If you're a part of a church that does not believe that, but believes you can just do whatever you want to take any particular day, just pick a day. But if you don't believe that God said, remember the seventh day to keep it holy, and not to work on that day, but to rest on that day. If you are part of a church that looks at that as not being important, it cannot be the written the church. That cuts out a whole lot of churches. Yeah. Am I right about it? Yes. But, but I didn't make that up. Is that not in your Bible? Yeah. Do you see it there? Yeah. That's right in the Word of God which keep the commandments of God. Now listen, it does not mean that everybody in the church will be obedient to commands. It does mean that the church agrees that the commandments should be obeyed. Am I right about it? In other words, there may be people that make mistakes. There may be people that break the commandments, but there ought to be a church that says we agree in keeping all the commandments. Last time I checked, there were at least 10 of them. <laughs> Am I right about it? Yes. Now the problem that we face today in this society, that people think that the commandments are optional. But God says that is the way you judge if they are a church of God or a church of Satan. Now listen, I'm catching, don't miss it. I'm not saying that you are part of Satan. I'm just saying to God that Satan has some churches. And his churches disagree with keeping the commandments of God. Amen. Oh, y'all got y'all mad at me tonight. I'm sorry. You know, you know, I don't really care if you're mad. It doesn't bother me one bit because I gotta stand before God. I gotta tell God I told the truth. I gotta be able to say I done done what you told me to do. And when I stand before God, I can say, I read the word of God. Isn't that pretty clear? Yeah. Commandments of God, isn't that pretty clear? Yeah. But then that's not it. There's a comma, which means there's more. It says then, after that, it says, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
Isn't that powerful? Yeah. Well, immediately when I see that, I, 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 I say, well, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Well, then I have to go to another Bible text because I'm not just going to make up something, but I'm going to take that word, testimony of Jesus Christ, and the way I'm going to study the word of God, I'm going to go throughout the Bible to find this word, testimony of Jesus Christ, and see if I can find an explanation of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Will you go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10? Can y'all put it on the screen? Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. I'm not just going to make a oh, all well, the testimony of Jesus means that you love Jesus. The Bible doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. What does the Bible say? And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren which have the word everybody. The testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the what? The That's what it says, isn't it? Isn't that what it says? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't, did I make that up? No. Is it in your Bible? Yes. Some of you all think, well, wait a minute, you got a different Bible. It's the same Bible that you have. <laughs> Amen. There are two qualities of God's the church, and you can judge any church by these qualities. First of all, they must keep the commandments of God, and secondly, they must have the gift or spirit of prophecy uh, manifested in their church. And so whenever you decide to join a church, make sure you join the right one. Don't just join one because your mama was in it. Don't just join one because they have the best preacher or the best choir or a big building. Make sure that they have two qualities. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the gift or spirit of prophecy. Am I making myself clear tonight? Yes. God has a church with these unique characteristics so that we can know which church he sends storms to. Every church don't get the same kind of storm. The church of God receives storms because sometimes, even though they are God's church, they begin to complain, criticize, and doubt. In God's church, God's church is in a perfect storm. Jesus says something to them. Not only Jesus does he come to them in the storm, but he says something to them. He says, it is I, do not be afraid. See, what happens is that the storms are so bad in our lives sometimes, in the church's life, that we are afraid of the water and we're afraid of the ghosts. And we finally found that Jesus is coming in and we recognize and we focus on Jesus. And when we start focusing on Jesus, all of a sudden, the storm is not that bad when we focus on Jesus, hallelujah. When we focus on Jesus, all the doubts fade away. All the criticism fade away. All the complaining is out the window. When we focus on Jesus and we realize he is coming in our boat. And the Bible says Jesus came up to the disciples in their terrified, shock of condition. And he said, don't be afraid, guys. It's not a ghost. It's Jesus. Oh, I can see them relax. Their hearts start start slowing down, their blood pressure went a little bit lower, realizing that Jesus, and what Jesus does, listen to what happens when, when, when Jesus comes to people in a perfect storm. First of all, they willingly received him. In other words, they were happy. No, they had joy. Are y'all listening to me? The way, they get, the way you get joy in your church is to willingly receive Jesus in your life. Willingly, you, he, he doesn't force him his way in. He will not kick your door in. He will not knock you out to bring you in. What he does is he makes the storm happen until you get to the point where you say, I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. And you get to the point where you say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. Uh, no other help, I know, until you get to the point where you say, God, I need you more than I can say. And there's nobody like and when we focus on him, all of a sudden, the storms are not that bad because if Jesus is the captain, I can smile at the storm as we go 
as soon as the boat yes, sir. got Jesus in it, yeah. it, it all of a sudden was at the place of ministry. Yes, sir. Yeah. It was in a storm. <laughs> Out on the sea. Winds blowing back and forth. But when Jesus gets in the church, yeah. hallelujah, yeah. it just gets to the point of land, yeah. of ministry. All of a sudden, the disciples became disciple makers uh, before they were scared, doubting, criticizing, complaining church members. But when Jesus, oh, what happens when Jesus gets in the boat? All of a sudden, the ship didn't have time to fly the land, didn't have time to roll the land. It just appeared on the land because Jesus was in the boat. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be a disciple maker, let Jesus come into your ship. Let Jesus come in. Focus on him. Amen. I'd like to tell you tonight, there is a storm on the way. There is a storm on the way. My Bible tells me I don't have to take a weatherman because they are not 100% accurate. I don't have to take the National Weather Service because they get it wrong. But the Bible lets me know there is a storm coming to your church. Let me show it to you in the Word of God. It's found in the book of Daniel. What book did I say, everybody? Yeah. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel, the 12th chapter. There is a storm on the way. Daniel 12 and verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time and, hallelujah, I like that and right there. And at that time, your people Amen. shall be what, everybody? Deliver. Deliver. Everybody shall deliver. deliver. Everyone found written oh. in the book. Amen. Amen. There's a storm coming to your church. Yeah. Coming to all the different churches that love the Lord. A storm that is going to be so great. There has never been a storm, a never been a time of trouble like this time of trouble. Because the devil hates your church. If you decide to be obedient to the commands of God, the devil hates your church. He's going to implant emissaries and secret agents in your church. He's going to have spiritual terrorists in your church. He's got them in there already. You better look around and say, I don't know who you are. I don't know, I don't know who you are. Man, the, the, there's some people in your church that want to take you out and the devil has put them. And you know what? You can't kick them out the church. Yeah. The very ones you try to kick out might be the right ones that need to stay. So you just got to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. But the Bible lets me know in the book of Daniel, there's going to come a time when the devil is going to have a hostile, a uh, uh, public hostile attack on the church of God so strongly that it's going to be a time of trouble that was never been. It's never been a time of trouble like this before. And my job as a minister of the gospel is to let you know how church. I'm going to talk to you tonight. It's about one more text. I'm going to, text. I'm going to give you one more text I need to give you because I need to, to know you how to handle a storm. How do you get your joy? How do you get your joy in the storm? See, God is so great that he can let a storm come and you can have joy in the storm. All right. Are you ready for it? Yes. It's found in the book of Psalms. What book did I say, everybody? Psalms chapter 91, verse 1 through 11. Psalms chapter 91, verse 1 through 11. This is, this is, the, this is a storm shelter text. This is how you get joy in the storm. This is what you ought to, you ought to keep this on your wall somewhere. Ready for the storm. He that 
dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my blood, everybody, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee, hallelujah, with His feathers, and under His wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flyeth by day, nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall I behold and see the reward of the wicked, because Thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. Yes. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels a charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. This is a strong shelter. I get joy just by thinking about it. Jesus, Michael, is going to stand up in the storm. When the storms come to your life, when the storms come to your church, when the storms come to your home, you need to have a storm shelter. You need to have something that will get you through the storms. In church, we are going to have some storms. Some bright lights are going to go out. You, you better not trust in the conference. You better not trust in the other different elders or, or the pastor. You better have your own storm shelter. You better have your own relationship with God. You better know it for yourself. You can't wait for somebody else to get your joy. You got to get your own joy. And you get your joy by going to the word of God. You, you need to be a part of God's church. It's not a perfect church. But it will travel through a perfect storm. Um, what, what are the chains that are holding you from full commitment? What are the chains that are holding you back? Um, you will never know joy while you're in these chains. Father and his son and his son's friend went out sailing on the Pacific Ocean. Father took the two boys out, son and the son's friend. They were in the boat with the father. As they ventured out way into the deep of the ocean, a fast storm came up behind them. The father realized that there was no way for him to bring his ship back into the harbor. And somehow, he was going to have to fight through this storm. The storm was a perfect storm, it was a killer storm. And the storm, the father knew, eventually would take over the boat. And regardless of how hard the father tried to keep the sailboat above the water, the restless and dangerous terrent waves crashed into this boat, rocked it from side to side, until finally this boat capsized, throwing its three occupants into the, into the mighty deep, into the water. As it was thrown, they were thrown into the water. The father was close to the capsized boat, and he had a lifeline, and he had to make a decision, an excruciating decision. Who should get the lifeline first? If he threw it to his son, then the friend would be lost. If he threw the line to his friend, then his son would be lost. He didn't have a lot of time, just seconds, to make a decision. And as he thought about it, he remembered that his son was a Christian. He loved God, and he served God. He had given his life to God, and he knew that his son was right with God. And he yelled out to his son, I love you, son. I love you, son. And he threw the line to the friend because he knew the friend was not.
not a Christian. As your friend was holding on to the line and the father brought him back in, by that time his son had disappeared under the deep waters of the night. His body was never recovered. Somebody asked him, why did you do that? Why didn't you save your son? When the man said, at the resurrection, at the resurrection, I'm going to see my son again. But his friend, where would he be in eternity if I didn't throw a lifeline to him? One Friday afternoon, there was a terrible storm on a hill called Galatine. God the Father could throw up a lifeline to his own son. But if he saved his own son, all humanity would be lost. He cried out to his boy, I love you boy. You're my boy. But I got to save mankind. He threw a lifeline out so that you and you and you That he gained his only begotten son. And whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Hallelujah. But have everlasting life. What chain can hold you from that kind of love? What chain is holding you from that kind of love? You can't be saved unless it's by the name of Jesus. Wherever you are tonight, I want you to know there's power in that name. Amen. Wherever you are tonight, God wants to save you. He's so much God that he'll come in your storm. He'll come in your financial storm. He'll come in your storm of depression. He'll come in your lonely storm. He'll come in your storm of addictions. He'll come in your little prideful fake Adventist storm. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, he will. He'll come in your storm and he'll walk on water because he's got a powerful man. Jesus! He shall save his people from their sins. Today, the chains can fall off your life. And today you want that power in your life. There's power in that day. There's power to break every chain. Somebody today wants to stand up with me and say, I believe in that power. If you believe in it, will you stand with me today? In the name of Jesus. Come on, sing it with me.
front. I want you to come down front and boldly say, this is the church that God has called me to be with. Maybe you need to change your membership. Maybe you need to make a bold step because night after night, you've been hearing the truth. The truth has been so powerful that if the devil would just listen, he'd join himself. I'm telling you tonight that God is calling you to make a decision and whoever you are, you can get every chain broken tonight. I didn't say some change, but you can get every change. Why don't you step out? They can be start with God. Maybe you've been baptized and you need to start over with God. And you want to start anew with God. You want to be a part of this baptism. I'm going to ask you to step out of the aisle and we're going to sing this song for you two more times. And when you get an opportunity to come, this is the best time to come. This is a good time right now. Why don't you come?
the people that will come close to it will be caught on fire. Then save us, O oh God, by that mighty name, the name of Jesus. Your name, do we ask these wonderful mercies? Amen. 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 You are dismissed. Amen.